So hopefully you share my so, screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like I noticed that some questions, at least in the multiple choice area, mm -hmm. they mentioned I think the board, the board's model. Or yeah, something. so for our semester, like this one, there won't be really anything um like you won't be asked anything like that. This is for okay. the standard semester. Can you see the exam on my screen? Yeah. 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 Like the whole thing? Yep. yep. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so for you guys, it'll be more instead of doing the, um, like the exam, the questions for the board, it'll be more questions like for the stuff you use this semester. So there'll be some Git stuff, of course, that you did in the tutorials, and then also like some basic stuff on the, um, the, the emulator, right? But like, because you guys did the project yourselves, you should be fine. Like generally the exam is in the course is put there for like um, sort of checking, like if you somehow copied your entire project, you probably couldn't answer yeah. the questions, but if you did it yourself, you should be fine. You don't need to study for those questions if you had done the project, but yeah. Okay, no. So, I mean, I guess I can also ask you guys if you have an idea if it's true or false. So the first one, a video game is a problem program that has been designed in respect to hard real-time constraints. False. False. Yes. So, what, and then what's hard real time? Uh, like applications in which um, meeting deadlines, meeting time points is absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. It's actually the, the definition, uh, the second the second statement, but if you exchange stuff yeah, with them. Pretty much. <laughs> so, yeah. like a hard real time means that deadline, a system failure, like not meeting a deadline is considered a system failure. So, yeah, it must be respected. Yeah, so like on a, in a pacemaker, the person, if you miss the deadline, like if you don't send the signal, the person can have a heart attack and die. <laughs> so it can be very serious. Or like software time, meaning um, like a game. Like if we don't make a frame, the performance goes down, but like the system doesn't fail. It just continues at like a suboptimal like quality. Okay. So yeah, I just want to get my pen. Thank you, Red. So yes, false. So then the second question, we sort of know the answer, I guess, is a uh, uh, false. Yeah, actually, it should so, be should always meet meet the uh, deadlines. Must. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, if you want to make it correct, I mean. Yeah. So this would be um. So should, uh, shit, what's going on? Should. So yeah. this would be. True. Oh, actually, hold on. I'm gonna make this more explicit. What's going on with my pen? <laughs> there we go. Um, make it blue. Get rid of okay. big ass hands. Okay, man. There we go. Should. And this would be true. Maybe that makes sense. Um, so to achieve predictable real-time behavior, it is not enough to have an exact clock and a deterministic hardware platform. Hmm. Hmm. Um, what exactly is meant by predictable? Uh, I mean, in, in which uh, terms uh, in relation with real-time behavior and programming? Well, like predictable is... Um, is deterministic really. Yeah. So like deterministic being like by the, from definition, like determine, so you can determine um, something, right? So like a deterministic anything means that you can determine its state at any point in time. So it's so, yeah. So if you give it like the same inputs, it will, you get the same outputs. Yes. That's what, it's, yeah. Okay. Okay. I also read online something about that, like deterministic, like algorithms or programs or you, you, you can know at some point in time that a certain number of states could take place. Mm -hmm. Does that not mean necessarily that you would know what output is going to happen as if I, something that like, if it depends on timing and or like external variables, then it will not be deterministic anymore. Yeah. Terms. This is the key there is like the, like the timing and anything like inside of the control or the program is like when it's, if everything's deterministic, like here you have a deterministic hardware platform, which is more or less also impossible to fabricate um, an exact clock. I mean, even the most high quality clocks 
are not a hundred percent precise, you know, like they drift, they have clock drift, which is a sort of like, you, know, you have a 80 gigahertz, but it's actually averages 80.0001, you know, like it has this sort of variation, but like what David said is that, that as soon as you go into like external, right? Like as, and most systems so most real time systems in specifically in this course is content being embedded, you know, like as we know that embedded system is like a brake controller or something that in some way usually interacts with some sort of external environment, people, sensors, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. This external thing you can't, is hard to make deterministic. Like theoretically you can create a model for the universe that is deterministic, right? But mm -hmm. there's no way that humans are gonna ever, if ever manage to do this. Mm -hmm. So like fr from our point of view, the external environment is non-deterministic um, okay. for like pretty much in most situations. And therefore we can't really say that we can ever truly have predictable real-time behavior. Like even these really expensive systems and like going to Boeing's and stuff, then these, these planes that crash, mm -hmm. they pay like shit tons of money to have control systems that are 99.999, like, you know, 10 nines safe but they can't guarantee ever 100 percent. it's like impossible so um so i mean you get that the wording of this question to achieve predictable real-time baby is not enough yes yeah. true okay okay but, so, um mm -hmm. one 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 more question yeah. about the statement so um like um to for example, if it were possible to achieve predictable real-time behavior, what are the other parameters and maybe the others like variables that need to be considered mm -hmm. uh, except of the clock and the other yeah, platform? Yeah, so, okay, good question. Um, you need, for instance, like we have a few different things, like you have your, your code, right? Like your actual program mm -hmm. needs to have, for instance, if you have interrupts, like in general, like interrupts are really hard to model because they can, they're really random. So sort of like how your, your actual programs code, does it use interrupts, does it not? Um, does it have loops that have undefined bounds? Like, you know how, um, like is the loop always gonna be 10 times or is it some dynamic, you know what I mean? Like if you have some sort of, like if, if it's a program reading in packets from, from some network card, it might have 10, um, 10 packets in its buffer or 100. And if it's looping through these, this, this sort of, um, this loop n, like the value, is changing, and so this is this is not deterministic yeah. as such. I mean, you can't predict how much traffic is going to get sent to you, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. The hardware is a big one. So, hard deterministic hardware platform means you have to have like deterministic cache, and so generally this means people don't use cache because cache is really hard to model. Um, and for instance, and then like clocks, this is I guess hardware as well. Uh, what else do you have? Code, hardware. Caching. I mean, this is all sort of part of the hardware platform. Yeah. Hmm? yeah. Okay. So maybe the other point was to consider like software, basically the code. Yeah, like software plays a big role in it, right? Like, I mean, using free RTOS adds sort of like real time stuff, but it doesn't. It sort of takes away from our ability to validate or to verify our code. So I mean, there are like industrial um, real time operating systems. Uh, I think I, I linked a few in like the introductory lecture, like I sort of listed them um, and they provide like, um, you know, art, like industrial expensive implementations, but they can also validate their code. Like FreeRTOS is very, uh, it's not very safe. Like it's, mm -hmm. it, 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 it really is a free artist exists to make developing multi-threaded uh, real time aware applications easy, but it's not there for creating secure, like super, um, like high risk, hard real time programs or anything, right? Yeah, and so like this RTOS this operating system also brings in um, real time problems. So that could also be, for instance, you could list that, that would also be like having an operating system would be a, a variable, whether it's bare metal operating system or what have you, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay, then, so the free RTOS schedulers top priority is maximizing throughput. No. Yes. Easy. Did you guys go and um, I think we talked about scheduler a bit. I'm not sure if we touched on how the free arts or scheduler works, but I think it's sort of, you should be quite familiar with how it works from you doing the project, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, like, um, like I thought to myself in a way that like the free arts is there just to basically give access of resources to different threads and tests. Mm -hmm. I think when I think about throughput, I think about something like, 
like performance wise it has yeah. to have like yeah, a throughput certain, i think is generally a metric for like um like ne i think i also think of network cards like how many packets per second or the gigabit like how the gigabit yeah. throughput of like some cable interface what have you right exactly. and so the schedule like using throughput to quantify schedule's performance it doesn't even make sense exactly like what is it putting through like tasks per second but then like yeah. you have to quantify how big a task is blah 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 mm -hmm. yeah so i think like the free answers its top priority is really just simply running the highest priority tasks next because um do you guys know how it actually chooses the tasks like if you have like let's say you have i'll just write some random tasks you have tasks um with priorities like you have t1 has priority like four t2 three three has three and t4 has a one do you know um which one would get run like or how it's determined which in which order these run if you create them from create them this one first second third fourth like in your main i i think like the like the i think it was like the lowest number means the highest priority right other way around no oh. other way yeah yeah so the highest number has the highest priority bigger is better yeah we actually uh we actually like used to um there's this uh macro we defined like the config max priority and you substrate like you use the subtraction mm -hmm. to define which priority. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Go to. Mm -hmm. so it's I mean, a really good way of doing yeah. it doing um top minus. so in reference of the top priority mm -hmm. so i think in this case it should be t1 t2 t3 and t4 mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah, exactly and so why would t2 run before t3 if they have the same priority because it was created before t3 yeah I think there's a slide in like the lecture slides, which sort of has like the, a figure that looks like this, where it has like these tasks in like a row. And then like, this is the highest. And then it's like goes down lower and free answers literally just starts and runs through these lists. Like, and they're just pushed onto the back of these lists as they're created. And it just runs through them as these, these lists. So it just starts at the highest, runs through the list, goes to the next level, runs through the list, goes to the next level. I can't remember what it's called. Think like this it's like highest priority thing I, mean, I can't remember what you call it to say that it sequentially just goes through the task as in the order they were created but yes okay. that's the specific um algorithm i think in the free artos scheduler so anyway the tick granularity in free artos is independent of the cpu clock um... What's meant by granularity? Um, just like the frequency, I guess, the period, like you set it in the config. I think you, if you guys dug into the free artist config, you can set it to like, you know, a thousand, 2000 ticks yeah. or whatever, you know. Look, the, the granularity means like how we will increment its values as time passes by. Yeah, like, well, like you can figure the tick to happen like every 100 milliseconds, 1,000 okay. 1, milliseconds, 100 nanoseconds, or not nanoseconds, probably like microseconds. Um, and so the granularity is like how fine this period is, like how quickly. I think it's actually dependent on the CPU clock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Like the tick granularity is independent because you configure it in this free artist conf.h, right? And I can't remember, like if we just have a quick, I'm not sure, you're gonna see my, you see the terminal when I'm sharing it? Yeah. No, no. we actually see no. the top yeah. left uh, I'm corner. Share my whole screen. I think I can select to share my desktop. This is what I want. Yes. Yeah. So if we go into this one, there is this, this guy here, tick rate in Hertz. And so this tells you like, if we have a thousand Hertz, it's saying um, like one millisecond, right? Mm -hmm. But um, you imagine like on our computers, cause we do this on x86 machines is a bit different because it's sort of like, we don't directly use the clock. Like we don't have this sort of embedded low level access to the clock using timers and whatnot. But essentially you can imagine if you set that to a thousand, and you didn't change anything, but you swapped out your crystal on your board to like a double the speed clock, obviously your tick rate would, would become like 
five, 500 microseconds instead of a millisecond. Because the system tick, I think hopefully you guys can remember from the, um, from the introductory um, lectures where I was talking about sort of like the sys tick in FreeRTOS, like the sys tick is a hardware generated interrupt on embedded systems that triggers calling the uh, scheduler, right? And so if you were to actually increase your CPU's clock without changing any configuration of the peripherals or anything, you would, you would trigger this interrupt to be called more frequently and therefore you would influence the tick granularity of Freatos. So this is like the long explanation of why. So this is, this is false. Because <clears throat> I guess if you increase the hardware's rate, you'd have to change your config to achieve the same clock. So um, the maximum achievable frame rate of an application is limited by the refresh rate of the screen. I, I mean, I think like the refresh rate of the screen is something that we place like a suggestion of when it should be woken up. But if you like don't plan higher tests, like the priority and how much time each test is going to run, it could mm -hmm. like push um, things um, later, right? Like if you have like a higher priority test that's running before this, the, the, the screen refresher mm -hmm. and it's, it's taking too long. I have like a, like a while loop that's going forever. I'm going to push mm -hmm. that limit. Um, I think that way of thinking about the question is like thinking like, let's say you have a really lightweight game yeah. that can achieve 200 FPS, but you're running on like a standard monitor that like, or on the hardware of these little boards, the, um, these little SPI screens. And, but actually better said is like a monitor because these desktop monitors generally have like some sort of spec that says like maximum refresh rate of like 50 Hertz, oh. 60 Hertz. Right. Okay. And I know from like when I used to play, Age of Empires way, way back, that you'd have like running at like 200 FPS or something. But like, are you actually seeing 200 FPS? Well, like, uh, no. Right. Like you're only seeing so the maximum limited, pressure on the screen. Yeah. So I mean like the actual achievable, I mean, I think achievable, I guess this question's worded a little loosely, but I would say like the achievable frame rate is like the actual like what was a managed, like how many frames are actually sent to your screen. Okay. It's actually the limit of the hardware, so to say. Yeah, so it's, a, it's set by the hardware limit. Um, okay. So I would say this is true. Right? It would be the same for even our games because we're all running these on laptops on this emulator um, and our monitors on our laptops are probably very similar. Like, and they actually have like a 50 FPS refresh rate or something. And so mm. I think running the demo, you can see like 60, 70, 100 FPS, but we're not actually seeing that. Okay. Um, so this is something I guess you guys didn't really touch on, but I mean, yeah. um, do either of you know anything about this? I actually don't. Uh, I mean, this might be useful for you, Daniel, if you're going to take over tutoring ESPL. Can we configure this either input, output, or bidirectional? Well, I don't really know, but I thought that the pins were mostly. I mean, I think that it depends on the board, right? Like on whatever microcontroller I'm using, it's going to be configured in different ways, right? Mm. Or like so generally like, so like GPIO stands for like general purpose input output, right? Okay. And so I wonder if I can find like a, um, like a, a figure somewhere. Um, So like, um, so to answer the question, like in quick, yes, or bi-directional, no, but input and output, right? So let's yeah. say, um, let's see, maybe it registers cheat sheet. This sounds good. So like generally, um, how GPOs work is they have like a, they're sort of in a, a port and the port has like pins and then you can check like, Hey, in this port, is this pin being like, you can sort of have this, the port has like eight pins that say, and then that you also have a configuration register for this port. And then you can set, for instance, the um, push up, um, pull up resistors, pull down resistors, setting input, output, and then a whole heap of other things. And you set this in this configuration, like registers. Um, oh, I want to, I want to, there's usually some nice sort of figures. And so for instance, 
port data. Port da -da -da. No. No. Okay. But it's like a G and GPA, you can either set it like as an output, like in manually in your code to say, um, like set an LED, or you can set it as an input and buttons. Actually, better example is I will go to the, um, I think, no. So this is the de the demo code normally used in the course. Um, okay. Sorry. Um, and in, in the main or the demo.c, there should be, or it might be in the ESPL libraries, um, code to set up the um, this. to set up the GPO pins because this is on this STM board I think I showed it in the lectures you guys haven't seen it um, I don't think I have one what I had one at home so. mm. Oh, yeah, I do. So I don't know if what you guys can see, but this is the board, right? Can you see this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so like you have on board LEDs, which are like little guys in here, and you obviously have buttons coming into it because this is what the students will have, right? And so you need to be able to configure this board to say, yes, on the LEDs, I want to output a digital signal to turn the LED on, but I also want to read in the button press for the buttons, right? And this changes from application to application, so you need to be able to reconfigure these. And so this is what GPOs do. They're a general purpose button that you can reprogram, right? And this also comes on, um, with like pull ups and pull downs. Do you guys know what that is? Pull up resistors. I think it's something about like and, and how it like controls the voltage that comes in, right? The thing that yeah, it stops it from like floating and just exactly giving static. But exactly. um, so this is the the code that runs in, that initializes the GPOs on the project, the demo project. And so we can see here, like how STM's libraries work is that they, they have these like initialization structures that you then fill and then you call this init uh, call here. But we can see for instance here, um, initialize external buttons. So this is where you're setting the pin, like this will be some number that's set in a define and you're setting its mode. So here we have an input because this is for the button. So it's gonna be some input and we wanna pull up resistor on it and then we'll have the output for the LEDs over here somewhere, maybe LED. Where are you? Yep. No, it's neat. No, but all like um, output should be also not there somewhere. But there'll be a similar configuration somewhere where it configures the LEDs as output. Maybe they're not even configured on the default project. I don't know. But then quickly going back just to explain this as well for you guys what pull ups and pull downs are. Um, if you have like a GPO pin, it's just an analog. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just some wire that is getting this digital signal sent into it. And now this configuration registers like setting an input, output, pull up, pull down resistors. It actually configures the hardware and actually turns on and off these resistors. But if you can imagine you have this wire, essentially, that's going to read an input. Um, if it's not set to either five volts or ground, if it's just sort of left open, it's just gonna sort of flutter around. It's gonna pick up static from the lights and from like all this electromagnetic interference and it's just gonna create random values. Um, and this can be really seen when you're using like the ADC, you know, a, analog ADC, analog digital, yeah, ADC, right? And then it'll pull in some, like if you just let an ADC not tied to any input, which takes in a signal and converts it into a digital value, it'll just randomly flutter because it's picking up interference. And so these pull up and pull downs, what they do is they say, if there's no input, tie this voltage to like ground or five volts. And so generally it means that you'll have like some button here, like, so this is your um, GPAO, and then you'll have like it attached to some switch here. And this is your actual button here, right? But then there'll be this resistor that'll pull it down to ground. And then usually what you'll have is you'll have five volts here, like on the button source. And so it'll say like, when this button, when this switch is open, I want this GPO to be zero volts, like a fixed solid zero, okay. like not to fl flutter around and pick up interference and just create random jitter, because this can also cause the button to sort of get hit and um, 
create false positives, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And then, so this is what this would be a pull down, and it just pulls down the voltage to zero when it's not active. And when you press the button, you'll hit five volts. And so when this closes, you get five volts and you've got your positive signal. But similarly, you can do it, you can configure it the inverse way that you actually have a pull up um, that goes to five volts or like 3.3 volts, whatever your logic level is, right? So it just goes to VCC. And then this this would probably be different that you'd have you'd have ground here to say but this would be an active low signal, right? And so that's what a G, that's what a pull up and pull down does. So if you don't configure a pull up or pull down on an input, but you don't only need them for input because for output, obviously you don't have that problem. Um, you won't get you get random like you won't be able to use it. Yeah. Okay. Um, but then this one is false because so by the can't be bidirectional. Right? Yeah. Like, I mean, you can achieve bidirectionality, but you have to reconfigure the pin. Like, so if you had like, a one, like a one pin microcontroller that you need to like, you like read in a value and then showed an LED was on or off, you'd have to like sort of program it to read the value, reconfigure and turn the LED on. Okay. Like, somehow you need some sort of weird hardware to do this, but like it is bidirectionality is achievable, but not implicitly by setting the pin to being bidirectional. Okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, the next question, I guess, is sort of um, might, you might now hopefully be able to sort of answer this, even though you haven't had much experience with pull ups and pull downs. Yeah, reduce input noise. That noise would be mean like, um, like false values, right? Like being. Yeah. So, this okay. is what I'm saying. Like, like, if you ever hold like, a, like an oscilloscope probe um, in a room, like not grounded, like take the, and just like ground the negative to something and then just hold the probe in a room with like, lights on and you'll yeah. see like 50 50 hertz noise right okay like which is always something that always stumped me in my undergrad you'd be debugging something like man where's this 50 hertz coming from and then you know uh -huh. oh, the lights <laughs> um <laughs> okay and and so this is it so if like you had no pull down resistor so you've left this pin like not tied high or low like would this reduce input noise no like you you would need it to reduce input noise so if you yeah. don't have it you would not so like this this is like false, so you need like whatever, you need this pull up, uh, whereas like pull. And so there we go, no pull, no pull. Was it? And then for the input, you need like pull up or okay. down. Down even, I don't think any, there's no outputs configured in this project. Okay. So priority inheritance. Do you guys remember what priority inheritance is? Yeah, I remember it was something like, I remember like there was a, like the general context of it was when you have like different um, priorities running together and then at some point a higher priority task is not able to take over and somehow a lower priority task due to like the situation ends up having priority over a higher priority one. Like, and there's a yeah. way you can protect your, your like your mm -hmm. implementation from that by using priority inheritance. Yeah, yeah. And so what it what uh, so I'll explain exactly. I'll do I'll go through that one again for clarity, but like so it's definitely in the right direction. What implements or what um so I mean so you have like this priority uh inversions probably problem and the, the solutions is priority inheritance. Mm -hmm. And so priority inheritance is, is implemented in free RTOS by what? Um I think creating uh, a task creating a task and created a task from the first task? Mm -hmm. No. Hmm. So we have like, for instance, there's the semaphore and the mutex. Yeah. So the mutex is a semaphore that implements priority inheritance. So. Box out other tasks or? Um, I'll explain it quickly. I'm just wondering what this box is on my screen. I have this feeling that Zoom's going to cut out because it doesn't let me do longer than 45 minutes because I'm not like premium or whatever. Oh yeah, there's, there's something like that. So if that happens, I'm just I'll send a new link and we'll start the okay. meeting. Um, but to explain quickly, like priority inheritance, um, like I'll drill a little diagram. I think I maybe drew in the in the lectures. You did, yeah. Yeah. So you have like the the problem is that you have like three tasks. Um, so you'll have like, let's say we have T1, T2, T3. Um, and we'll say like in this case that actually we'll do it properly. And we'll say we have T3. 
two and one. And so we'll say the their the number, like the identifying number is also their priority, right? So we have T3 is okay. our highest priority, T2 is our middle, yeah. and we have a low priority task, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, let's say that we have um, T1 is executing and it obtains some uh, resource, right? And we'll just do a little flag like this. So like whatever that is, we'll just say it's it's a lock to some structure, right? Mm -hmm. And it's executing. Now we're on a preempt, like we're running on a preemptive system, which I hope you guys know means that it can be yeah. interrupted. Like if a higher priority task needs to run, well, so the schedule has been invoked and it said, hey, yeah, T3 wants to run, it's high priority, let's let it run, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And so then we have this like preemption, right? So this is like, do some dots. This is pre -empts, preempts. And so T3 then starts executing because it's high priority. Good, everything's fine until now. But now let's say in T3, it also wants to obtain the same resource. So it's gonna try and obtain it, right? It's gonna like attempt, and so a little dotted flag here. And this is it, it's attempt, attempt to get it, but it's not able to get it because T1 holds it. And you can know from these like free Artos calls where it's like, um, like what's the, what's the call? Like take mutex and you put in the block okay. time. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, yeah. and generally like, like you can imagine here, he's put in an indefinite block time. So it's just blocked waiting on this resource, right? So now we have T3, our highest priority task is blocked. Now, so we'll return. So this means that it's, it's blocked. And so the schedule is going to be invoked again. And so we're going to go back to T1, right? So it's continued to where we were before. So up until this point, everything's still good because generally you want then T3 needs this resource and your system should be focused on returning this resource to the highest priority task ASAP, right? Meaning it wants to focus on T1 releasing this resource. But the problem is if we don't have um, priority inheritance on this resource, like this little flag what we're trying to obtain, the following can happen. Now, if let's imagine at this point in time, T2 is like, hey man, I want to execute. It's just time for it to wake up. It can wake up because it's high priority than T1, right? So mm -hmm. it's going to preempt again. So just preempt again. And now we have T2 running. So what we have here is that we actually have T1 or T2 running. When we have T1 blocked, we should have, we want T1 to run. It's our highest priority task. And so by doing so, we have made t2 more important than t3 which is explicitly wrong or false because t3 is a higher priority right uh, and so this is um yeah this is like priority, what we call priority inversion because we've essentially made t priority two more important than t3 we've inverted the priorities right so this is the problem so this is our problem this is priority um Inversion. And so the solution is to use priority inversion, uh, inheritance. Inheritance. And this is done, done using mutex, using mutex. I found something about the priority inversion and priority inheritance in, in that tutorial book uh, put in the mm -hmm. Piato documentation. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, it's, I mean, generally mutex is like mm -hmm. not just in free art, uh, a semaphore that does free uh, priority uh, inheritance. Mm -hmm. And so to quickly explain like how this, like how it solves it, we have the same thing again. We have T1 running. It's going to obtain its little resource. It's going to keep running. We'll get execute and then it will get interrupted. So we'll do the exact same things happening again. And then T T1, T3 wants to obtain the resource, which can't happen. All good. Go back and T1 will execute. Now the difference is that what priority inheritance does is that it raises the priority of a task holding a resource to that of the highest priority task which is trying to take the resource, right? 
So like the actual dynamics of how it's implemented is very much like how like free arts is implemented, blah, blah, blah. But the general idea is that like at a moment in time, for instance, this moment in time, when this resources are tried to be obtained, it's going to say, Hey, okay, any task holding the task, holding this resource should have its priority temporarily raised to that of this task. Right? So at this moment, T one gets a priority of three temporarily. So at this moment, in time, now we have this T one with a priority T three. And so as you can imagine, like at this point in time here, when T2 wants to, wants, wants to interrupt, the schedule is going to say, no, it doesn't work. T1 is executing, it has priority of three, right? And so we're going to have, and then we'll just get normal execution. So um, T1 will continue executing, blah, 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 blah. Probably made this a bit too tight, packed here. It will release its resource. And then what we can do is that we can have preemption up to T, T1, which will then obtain the resource. Yep. So this means that we've avoided T2 being able to interrupt. Make sense? Okay. Yep. Yep. So the case true. question, right? Mm -hmm. what, pardon? What's that? So like the, the question is, It would be true in the case, the, the true or false ah, question. Right. Priority has, by increasing priority of the liver task to that currently holding resource. Yes, true. Yep. It's true. Okay, so uh, last question, which you guys also have any experience with, is the ADC peripheral. So this is, uh, an, what's the word, analogous? It's the equivalent of the mouse in the emulator. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like, what, like, what is ADC? Like, what are those three let letters stand for? Maybe you I thought it was analog, analog digital, digital, digital convert. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. So, I mean, the question just kind of explains itself. If you know what ADC stands for, it's pretty easy, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you mentioned that it, mm -hmm. it it would be like the equivalent to the mouse in our game, and, and how's that so that it's the mouse, the ADC? Yeah, because the mouse sort of like converts like an actual where your mouse is on the table, right? Okay. So let's say like you had like the left and the right bounds of your table. Um, and like it's this, the same as saying like the left of your table is like when you have a joystick, it's the left of the table is zero volts and the right of your table is five volts. Okay. And as you move it, you're getting some digital value that is actually a representation of where your mouse is physically at the ah, table. Okay. It's sort of like the equivalent. Because to explain it for like how this, like for future students or for you guys, when you're using like an actual hardware platform. So what the, the joystick on this board, this little guy here, you can move around. It's just a combination of two potentiometers, right? And I, hopefully you guys have been exposed to potentiometers before, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So like it's two variable resistors that run between two bounds. And in this case, it'll be like zero and VCC. So you generally like zero and three volts, zero and five volts, whatever your board's logic is running on. And so when I move the X controller, like left and right, uh, this this on the joystick, I'm probably I'm moving the potentiometer's resistance between like the the bias between the zero and the three volt. Can you both hear me? Yep. So I think yes. I can't remember where I where that last one cut out on, but essentially the ADC will. When you're moving like the X axis of your joystick, when it's sitting in the middle, it means it's splitting the voltage evenly left and right. So you probably get some value that falls between like, let's say you have a 12, 12 bit ADC. This means it's maximum value is like two to the 12, whatever that is. And if it's sitting in the middle, it's giving you the, the value that's between, like halfway between zero and that maximum value move to the right. And it'll just move up towards that two to the 12. And so this is also when you talk about the bits of an ADC, a 16-bit ADC has a maximum value of 2 to the 16. Uh, and so it has more resolution, obviously. So it can tell you smaller actual changes in voltage, right? I think the one on the, the STM boards is 12-bit. So the, the value that you can maximize, the value you can get is, um, 
is 2 to the 12. So um, I'll just move this out of here. So can one of you guys tell me what a deterministic program is? I think it's a program that um, when given same inputs is capable of returning the same outputs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a pretty good answer. So I should write that one in here. Um, a, a program that when given the same input generates the same output. Perfect. What is an embedded system? Tough question. <laughs> do we actually, um, when defining an embedded system, do we actually need to consider um, like uh, stating the, the outside environment and the sensors, the actuators, the, those things? I mean, it's sort of more like the definition of like an embedded system itself. Like, um, I think um, when defining it in that way, it's, it's only uh, a system um, capable of having like input, output, memory management, and is designed to fulfill a particular uh, mm -hmm. like function or mm -hmm. part a particular like, task. The input output is not necessarily an, an embedded system's okay. characteristics, but the this, this sort of dedicated task, like functionality is one. So I'd say like it has, generally okay. has a one functionality, right? Can I spell this functionality? Um, like a brake control or whatever, like it's just gonna, it's just gonna do this one thing, right? Yeah. Like, a, like a network card is an embedded system because it just receives network packets. Um, it's generally, um, let's talk on like more physically, it's generally quite, uh, quite small and low power, low power, um, also resource constraint. Like they're usually generally small microcontrollers with small, low frequency clocks, small amounts of memory. Um, but at the same time, they use milliwatts, right? Um, char characteristically from their function, uh, from their sort of applications, they generally, um, generally yeah, sort of interact with uh, the environment. So this is like sensors, et cetera. Um, and they are generally, or they can be generally slash can be part of a larger system. So good example on our phones, we'll have a DSP, like a digital signal processor. This is a, this is a microcontroller or an embedded system, but it, it works part of our phone, right? So when we say, okay, Google, um, the DSP is the embedded system on your phone that's actually responsible for waking your phone. Oh shit. And then my phone's just said some stuff in the background. Um, I think Daniel is somehow blocked from entering the meeting. He just oh, sent shit. a message. I have no idea how to use Zoom. Chat back to meeting. Participants to invite. Ah, here. Got stuck in the waiting room. Hey, you're back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. So, sorry about that. So we're just going through what an embedded system is, and um, oh, okay. I think we've pretty much got it. So I think uh, four points that I could think about off the top of my head. Um, they generally have one functionality. They're part of a larger system, meaning something like a like a brake controller in a car controls the brakes part of a car and the whole, let's say, larger computer that is a car. Um, they're usually quite small, low power devices and resource constraint, and they interact with the environment generally, right? You're using sensors, actuators, and this sort of stuff, right? So like my laptop doesn't generally interact with the environment. There's no real, like I don't have temperature sensors, external temperature sensors on my laptop or actuators connect to, to my laptop, right? Do you think of anything else? So um, so now we have the worst case execution time. 
So like quickly, I think this question might come up in a second, or it'll probably come up in the exam. We'll have the worst case execution time and the worst case response time. So in this question, I'm asking like, what's the worst case execution time? So like in the case of like for each measure, like the worst case execution time, you have to like look at like, as if like every task would have like the worst possible case scenario which will execute the longest time and maybe like take into account preemptions and all of that like that's to like the way to go and how to calculate it mm -hmm. i think yes, you need to mm -hmm. i think when when calculating worst case execution time you need to like um consider uh, calculating it with the most uh with the longest uh time that a task needs to execute then yes. add it up like so i think you've just explained what worst case execution time is and wait uh the other one was the worst case response time so the execution time is purely this task has this code how long it's at worst case you know like if your loops are as large as it can possibly be how long will this task code get take to execute, right? So it's like the execution time. The response time is sort of like, given this is like task is the same code, so I have this sort of worst case execution time, what is like what everything that can go wrong to make the response as long as possible, meaning it gets interrupted by like every other single task and the network delay is like at its maximum. Like how long does the system take to execute and respond because of external factors like interrupts and whatever. Make sense? So, uh, yeah, so for, for example, the, the, the response time is, which one is part of the other? Is the so worst case time, response yeah. time is the worst case execution time plus mm -hmm. mass maximum. I'm not sure what, how you'd exactly say it, but like the maximum delay that can be incurred from interrupts okay. external input um environment right okay yep. so execution time is purely execution of code mm -hmm. without these external factors right yep. so um then what now, now we know like what can influence the execution time so how the long code. our code takes on our board to execute like as you said from what i've understood like it's hard to measure execution time when we're talking about like different ta like multi-threaded tasks which have different priorities that could kind of like interrupt each other and like change behavior at a certain point. Mm, but this is for the response time. Okay. So the, we want to look at just purely like we have one task and has some code, things that we need to consider to determine in time how long that task will take to run. Like excluding it'll be interrupted because that that is part of the response time. I think starting with the with the actual code. Yeah, right. So like the code itself. Um, yeah, the code. Itself. Like, exactly. does it like how bigger is loops? Blah blah blah. Right. This is a simple one. Uh, and then what what are other factors that determine how long that code will take to execute on your system? Um, maybe maybe. I don't know, the hardware? Mm -hmm. So like the big things would be like, like hardware, but we can split this up into a few sort of like sub points. So we've got like the, if I can click here, like the um, clock frequency, right? So if we took the same code onto a different platform with a higher clock, it'd be quicker, right? Um, a big thing is caching. So like, you know, if it's, if the code executes with, you guys probably don't really know what this, means but like with 100 percent cash hits meaning the cash is working perfectly it's going to run a lot quicker than if the cash is constantly uh, I'm going familiar to be with that. yeah yeah right so if the cash yeah. is hitting not constantly it's going to execute really quickly so you obviously need to do calculations as if you're getting nothing but cash misses right mm -hmm. because the cash will influence the execution time quite a lot um hardware what else can play a role like this can also be things like temperature um can play a role like maybe the, the oh. system works is, is overheated and is getting thermally throttled or something internally. And so this is making, so you just think of these sort of like hardware characteristics. Um, so if we have code, 
clock hardware, what else can influence the execution time? Mm, actually, have, do I have the solutions? Because I have a lot of good things in there. Hang on. Did I download the No, I think I'm just going to stop sharing for a second. Pause the recording. So here are the solutions that I have messily done. Yeah. Worst case execution times had to computing. So this is, yep. Maximum possible, maximum possible blocking delay. That's a good word for it. So processor architecture scheduling other tasks policy. Events interrupts. That's the events interrupts. That's mostly the, the worst case response time. So these ones here aren't so this is I would say these are part of the response time. Okay. So I'd say that, that should be for what else? Code. Hardware. I mean, processor, like, this will also be, for instance, like, processor architecture, which is sort of like um, custom silicon, for instance, will be super quick compared to nothing. Uh, accelerators, hardware. Um, Sort of like the code the code itself um mm -hmm. one could say that the code itself already takes into account the blocking time that was written in the other pdf right the maximum blocking time because that that's how you implemented the like i say how the resources are being protected and whatnot not really no i'd say like for instance that would be this maximum blocking time was part of the response time like saying yeah hey we want to obtain this lock we need to think hey for the response of the program we're going to make and say, okay, cool. What, what's the maximum time that this resource would be ever locked? You know, like how long would we have to block maximum as a part of the response time? And so then why is it difficult to measure the execution time? It should be sort of apparent, like modeling this hardware, essentially, like modeling code and like validating code and verifying it is doable. And it's like a very active research area and it's whatever, but like modeling hardware, this like, especially modern, super complex hardware is so complex that it's like sort of impossible to do accurately, right? And so using yep. oscilloscope, there's no way we could model the, like a complex embedded system by just measuring things because um, you can measure things as much as you want, but these like very corner cases that appear like once every like 10 years or something, you can't measure them before you build your system. Like you can't validate your system that thoroughly uh, it would just draw out your development time ridiculously kind of thing. So um, and so these estimations are generally pessimistic, but are not very like accurate. People take like very safe and pessimistic approximations of worst case execution times and response times, but you can't really, it's very hard to say with a hundred percent certainty that you've actually gotten the correct execution time from a hardware platform. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, say so like, why is it difficult? Why is it difficult? Um, modeling hardware and systems is extremely hard. Um, let's say extremely hard and relies, relies heavily on statistical, statistical, analysis which is generally pessimistic but not 100% certain 100% certainty is just something you can really can't ever um, guarantee so which software solutions does free access to provide to prolong battery runtime of your device this is a bit of a tricky one it's like a sleep mode or something right 
that you could like mm -hmm. enter like into a critical point and just put to sleep the part like certain task or mm, i mean so for instance like the actually there's like this idle task in free so it runs when there's no other tasks to run but it's still clocking the cpu like the free artists itself can't actually put the cpu to sleep this is sort of like platform dependent like you can get these super low power microcontrollers that you can sort of put to sleep and they go into like a really low power sleep mode and you can wake them up again but then free artists would just have to implement like you'd have to have a free artist task that actually implements this system stuff like these sort of features but free okay. artists itself doesn't put the board to sleep but free mm -hmm. artists does have a few things that um can sort of uh, minimize the amount of time that the cpu because imagine free artists has like the biggest thing there's only really one feature i know of um and generally when you talk about these low power devices they go into a sleep mode and then they have to get they get interrupted to get woken up again some sort of hardware interrupt right mm -hmm. and so free artists generally has one ha like hardware interrupt that it's always has and this is the sysTIC, right and so like we want to be able to reduce the power consumption so what can we do to make the power consumption like better like temporarily suspend the cpu whenever possible mm -hmm. but if this sys tick is constantly ticking it's going to keep waking mm -hmm. it up yeah that's true so like free artos itself like so there's a couple of things like really one thing it can do which is not so much ideal because it will also it can also mess with the flow of your program but you could, for instance you could make the sys tick uh like you could increase the time the period of the sys tick okay so like if you were to have a, a, a what's it like a, um, a periodic tick you could make this tick longer so that if you did sleep between ticks it would sleep for longer but this would also obviously maybe mess with the flow of your program because your schedule will get called so uh, like there'd be such large delays between scheduler calls. So this is one thing you could do, not ideally, but one thing also we I quickly hopefully mentioned in the introductory lectures was tickless kernels. Yeah. Uh, do you guys remember, remember about this or know what this is? Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. I remember it like barely, you know, I think it was something about... Um, I like they're asynchronous in some way. They don't rely on like actual mm -hmm. time passing by to like execute like um, commands mm -hmm. and whatnot. Yeah, so like the scheduler is in general like in free access with the sys tick. This this hardware interrupt is triggered every like millisecond, and it calls and it interrupts the system, which then calls the scheduler. Right, and so this happens mm -hmm. periodically. The scheduler is always guaranteed to be called every millisecond. Let's say regardless mm -hmm. of its if it's actually needed like if you're an idle and that every other task is blocked you don't really need to call the scheduler because the schedule is going to get woken up it's going to execute code and it's going to do useless stuff right yeah um now how you can avoid this like even if you're if you put your hardware to sleep it's still going to wake it up to call the scheduler even the schedule has nothing really to do right mm -hmm. um tickless kernel is essentially you just scrap this sys tick like, so you don't have this hardware interrupt anymore and the mm -hmm. user itself, him or herself needs to be in charge of um, making sure that the scheduler is invoked when needed. Okay. So you can manually invoke the scheduler. Like this is one function call to actually start the whole process of executing the scheduler. And so you need to just, um, like if the end of some task, if you're finished, then you'd invoke the scheduler and it would see if there's something ready to be done. Um, and oh. generally this would mean that in like some sort of super low power system, it's let's say like it's monitoring for a button push you would set up an interrupt to be tr to be triggered by the button push and this interrupt would call the scheduler so you wouldn't okay. periodically call the scheduler you would only call it when you got this button push because then you can put your your um microcontroller to sleep like like proper sleep mm -hmm. until this button push happens and it might be like no one pushes this button for a year and so you can sleep for an okay. entire year and then call the scheduler right that's cool. so um so like tickless kernel mm -hmm. right so this is one thing um like a not great or not let's say like a not um not always ideal solution uh, like it like, has um, its own drawbacks well this is like so this is this is this is a great solution great mm -hmm. solution but not always um 
like this is a great solution for energy, but not always okay. great solution for performance. performance. Solution, yeah, for performance or usability, let's say, right? Like if we if you created your games to be tickless, you have to consider so many more things. Writing okay. code would be so much more complex. And so mm -hmm. it doesn't make creating a system quickly easy. Um, so the increasing the, the, or let's say increasing or de like decreasing the tick frequency. Sys tick frequency. So, but this, but can, or can, can mess with program, all right? So if you took the same system, the same system and just decrease the tick frequency and expect it to run the same, it, you know, it could mess with things. It's hard to say. Could be an or okay solution. But tickless kernel, if the situation fits correctly, is a is a very good solution for power saving. Okay. Um, so any questions to that one? No. Then um, what are semaphores used for? So Aren't specifically in in terms of what we did this semester with FreeRTOS, using like a FreeRTOS semaphore, which is not always the classical definition of a semaphore. I think okay. protecting resources, protecting shared resources. Are you sure? Also syncing, you can also sync sync tasks or like mm -hmm. um, processes, right? Yeah, so like Daniel's correct in saying that like in, in free arts, also the semaphore is generally used for okay. synchronizing. Yeah. It's, it, while it is a lock and like when you look up a semaphore's definition on Wikipedia, it will probably say something like using for resource protection. But mm -hmm. then we get into this problem that it doesn't do priority inheritance. Yeah. Yep. And so like in free artists, we have the semaphore, which is used for uh, synchronization, like sort of flagging, sending signals. And then we have the mutex, which is generally used for resource locking. Yep. Um, okay. So we say like synchronization. Synch slash signaling. So, um, what would be a case scenario for this? Like when you're like, you have a task that's drawing buffers and another one, another one that's swapping, like cleaning the buffers, you need them to be yeah. synced in a way that so, um, like drawing like a mean flagging, manner. let's say like uh, the next stage uh, in some processing pipeline, right? So you have like the task that reads input from a user, then we draw the frame and then we render the frame or something. So they can all like sort of trigger each other. Like I'm done, you can go now. Okay. Right? So yeah, synchronization or yeah, signaling, some event has happened, whatever, right? And so you can, yeah, like a task can block on an event uh, until it's, until some other task says, hey, this event's happened, wake up and do your thing, which is pretty much like flagging the next stage. Um, Ah, so this one might, this is always a bit, bit tricky. Um, ben, you guys can, I mean, you might have to just think about this one. And this is something I haven't really addressed in the course, like really ever. Um, but this is also a really good just thought exercise for you. Now, like, I think we had these callbacks in the AIO library and the students on the normal boards would have interrupts. And I think I explained in my little lectures about where we were using software interrupts to like emulate hardware interrupts but they're very much the same thing. They just interrupt the system's execution and call some code, right? Which you guys implemented by these callback function pointers. And if you're running on, an, on a hot embedded platform, you would use um, like these callback functions that are in the um, like interrupt vector tables of the board. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, that one's finished. So as you can imagine, you have an interrupt that executes, uh, interrupts your program executing and it goes into this interrupt context. So if you had some task, like let's say more, like an easy definition is to talk about just on these embedded boards, you're executing your main, like let's just say you have a main loop and it's executing and this interrupt happens and it goes and executes this ex interrupts code. And we call this going into interrupt context. Um, I think I touched on this briefly in some of the lectures, but essentially the like interrupt context is you can think it's like in a way a high priority level of execution. Like it's always gonna get it's always going to happen over your main loop, right? Interrupt comes, main loop's interrupted, interrupt handler, and this interrupt context is executed. Now, what would be the problem of putting a lot of work or a lot of code into interrupt handler? So let's say like you have a program or a, like a, some embedded pro program that a good example is using network packets. 
like what would be the disadvantage of putting all of the network packet processing in the interrupt handler? So like what I could think of is whenever like this interrupt is, is being handled, um, all of the rest of the code is going to be put on wait, right? Because this has like mm -hmm. the highest of highest priorities. So why, that's one thing, just like delaying um, the rest of the processes. But maybe like what I could think of is like if you're taking some global resources or something and then you just interrupt it before you give it back for some reason that that could also like mm -hmm. potentially give you a deadlock somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yep. It is, you have good points. So like generally, um, like what you said about like going to this sort of this interrupt co context, when you go into the interrupt context, you no longer have like scheduler priorities or your operating system or anything. It's just executing code. Right. And so on like a, if we wanted to build, we want to run a code on a real time operating system explicitly using priorities and all of this stuff. And so as soon as we go into interrupt context, we sort of lose this sort of this, this paradigm of having priorities and tasks because mm -hmm. we're just executing code. And so the, pro the problem is that you therefore lose the priorities attached to certain jobs, like actual like network traffic versus display output. Like they don't really have their priorities anymore because like we might set that the network task is less important than the output task, the display output. But if the, in the network traffic interrupt happens and we do all of the processing in that, it might delay the output task happening, right? Yeah. Because if we put all of the work in the interrupt handler, we can get stuck in it for a long period of time, mm -hmm. right? Meaning that we don't then go back in, if we were to move the, the work from the handler to the normal task, we could then use the scheduler to decide when it should be done. So like a really good, a good, um, a good way of processing things is that in the interrupt handler, you sort of set a flag. Say, yep, hey, network pack in the network interrupt handler, you literally just set a flag saying there is a packet waiting to be processed. End okay. of interrupt handler. Then you go back to normal execution context and your scheduler can say, okay, cool, output, display output's done. Now we're ready to do some network processing. And the network processing mm -hmm. task starts up again, has a look and says, hey, there's a packet waiting. Cool, let's process it. Right? Okay. And so you now also have this, this, um, this sort of use of priorities. Okay. okay. And so then the, but the, this is like, this is the, the disadvantage of having large amounts of work in your um, interrupt handler. But on the same time, some applications might really benefit from having lots of work in interrupt handler because it is guaranteed to execute as soon as interrupt happens. So like mm -hmm. in super time critical applications, ones where you're probably not using free RTOS, you might benefit very like highly from having the network packet um, processed the moment it arrives. Right. Okay. So this could be an advantage, but this is obviously um, sort of application specific. And generally, in most computer like computer science applications, you want to say you want to avoid um, putting the work in the interrupt handler because okay. it's you lose your your resources and your oh, not your resources, but your scheduler and all of this sort of OS abstraction and sort of framework usability. Right. Does that make sense? So. I'm not going to write that one down, but I hope that makes sense. And so, okay. and I think this, if I remember correctly, a really good example of this, I haven't really done any work on this. This is like in the Linux kernel, interrupts are split into two halves. They call like a top half and a bottom half. Um, and the top half is essentially what you get executed in the interrupt handler. And then the bottom half is what gets executed outside of interrupt context when the time is right. Um, which is what you sort of want to achieve by setting a flag. The top half would just be set a flag and the bottom half would be what you actually do. Um, so for anyone watching this in the future who really wants to get into it, I think, I think it's been a long time since I've read, read about in, Linux interrupts. Um, so I think we have one more question, but I think is about to kick us out. So I'll start one, I'll do one more call and then we'll finish this question. Okay. Okay. Pause recording. So this last one, I won't necessarily ask this in the oral exam because it's a bit too tricky because it takes too much time to do, but like we'll off maybe ask some similar questions um, based on like the sort of concept. And so the whole idea of this question, and one thing I've asked most years is to do something very similar to this, where I'm giving you some sort of basic function uh, program with multiple tasks and I just wanted you to sort of 
think about the output. Similar to in the exercises where we had that one, the last exercise where I have like four tasks and you need to print like four, three, two, one, whatever, right? This is yeah. a very similar idea. And then we have some sort of like some basic print, which is like full, you can just consider it just prints somewhere. Um, and then we'll, I'll just have like, we have four tasks and in our main, we have um, the creation of them with priorities okay. and also the order is important, right? Yeah. Um, and so we think about it as all I'm saying is I want to um, like one hyper period. So until the output repeats, sort of go through this program and tell me um, what the output would be. So, I mean, what, sh and then this sort of like generalized the questions I could ask you guys in the, in the exam. Well, like what are the things when we look at this code, like when it's printing and we have like the task with different delays and the main function, what are things that would influence the execution order of these tasks? Late, the delay times and the priorities would be like um, big influencers and also mm -hmm. when each task was created, like in the order of mm -hmm. creation. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much everything to look out for. And also then all um, to be, to be um, considered, like in this example, I don't think so, but like sometimes if like we had in the exercises, I think like, like from memory, like task three is woken up by task two sending a semaphore right signaling it or a task notification yep. or something right and so obviously you'd have to be aware that you know task two would execute before it sends the sample for which then wakes up and executes task three right yeah yeah so i'm usually not very actually good at doing these questions even though i write them um but let's try and figure this one out so we have task created one two three four that's the three. highest priority and then task three wait other way around so this is the most like important the one? Oh yeah, yeah yeah <laughs> same problem again there's one thing you should there's one thing you need to be sure uh, careful of in the exam then um but task two and three have the same priority but task two was created first so it means that um in our first tick we're going to execute task four so that the order will be four two three one so i'm going to write that down so i remember this see so the general execution order oops is based purely on priorities and not delays is four, two, three, one from here, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So in the case, task four would have the highest priority, right? From what you're writing. Yep. Yeah. Okay. yeah so be, I think that's what I said. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Two gets so like, um, get executed before three because it's uh, created before it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so the, that means that in our first tick, we would have, um, so I want to create, just see the output of this. So I want to say the first tick we would get, uh, like, so we'll do the ticks here, we'll go like tick one, two, three, four, five. We'll just do like 10 ticks or something. No, whatever. So um, first tick, um, we would just go to four. And then it's going to delay for four more Ticks. Ticks. Yeah. Now I have to remember this. I just check this out. Um, v task delay. So this is the one thing I always just forget whether it includes this tick. So if I say like sleep for four, if it'll sleep and wake up on like essentially the fifth tick or wake up again on the fourth tick. So specify the time at which the task wishes to unblock relative to the time at which V task delay is called. For example, specifying block for 100 ticks will cause the task to unblock 100 ticks after V task delay is called. Does not provide a good method. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So this means that it will sleep for four, it will wake up in four ticks time. So it will go, yep. it'll be asleep, 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 and we'll get on the fifth tick, another one. Because yep. this is four ticks relative to this one. Yeah. Yep. I've, I've understood this correctly. Um, now, then we'll have second one being called. So it will first delay, you know, here we have. So it'll just print two and sleep for four again. So that means it's going to sleep. It's going to pretty much be the same as four. So we get like one, two, one, two, three, four. 
and we'll get two again, I believe. Mm -hmm. Then three will execute. Now three has VTAS delay straight away. So in our first tick here, it's not going to print anything, but it's actually going to call VTAS delay. So it'll go and then we'll sleep. It'll wake up one, it'll wake up here. And yep. then it will sleep again for two and go another one. So one, two, one, two, one, two. Mm -hmm. And then we have one being executed finally. So it's going to print one and delay for one. So it's going to execute the next tick. So essentially you just get one, 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 one. So by looking at this, I can see like we have this output that would look like four, two, one, three, one, four, two, three, one, one, three, one. And this would repeat Oops, sorry. three, one, let's say three, one, one. And that would repeat. We happy with this? Make sense? Yeah. Yep. Have I missed anything? Uh, Safe perfect. print. It's printing like directly in the same line, right? That's what you're trying to show here, right? It doesn't like print yeah, in the next print. It's just a macro that like takes. I have this. I think from the code actually, when I when I write these exam questions, I have like an example little code that I put them into and generate the output to make sure that I haven't messed it up like by solving it. So I'm giving okay. you bad marks when I actually do it correctly. I run it on the hardware and check the output. And the safe ah, print is okay. what I use. And I have a buffer lock, which just means I have like this character array where I'm writing this to that I'm printing mm -hmm. to the screen. And it's the same thing. It's, it's like a buffer. And because I have four tasks that are all right into the screen, I need to lock it. And so I'm just taking this, this buffer lock must be a mutex that I've initialized. So I create it somewhere. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So or here. Yeah. So I've got a mutex. Um, that just locks this buffer that I'm going to. So I'll take it, I'll create my new line to add by using S print F. So I'll put it to the, to the end of the, the, like the current, like where I've written to. And then this is this GDISP, this is the UGFX library. So this is what is used on these boards. Um, this is the call to write it uh, to the screen. And then I'll just go to give it. So. And this is in a, in a macro because it's just saves some code size, making these nice and clean, yeah. So I think, um, so I think, I wonder if there's any other questions or anything we should talk about on the exams content. So Git would be part of it um, from the Git tutorial. Hopefully if you've all been using Git, it will be pretty simple. Like I'm not gonna ask you for some sort of like, hey, in this super complex re, um, rebasing scenario, what would blah, blah, blah happen? Um, what other content would be important? Uh, using the emulator and all the libraries, maybe some basic compilation questions, like because you did a lot of compiling and linking, um, all the different art, free art source features that you should have used, you know, queues, semaphores, mutexes, uh, task notifications, using interrupts through the AIO, like what they are for, general concept of how they're used. Sort of some of the theory from mostly like the free ATOS or the ATOS lecture where I talk about, for instance, things like uh, priority inheritance um, and the questions we've done in this practice exam. So do you guys have any questions about anything in the course? Yeah, um, do you like recommend uh, taking a look at the first videos of the lectures like we, we had on YouTube? Mm, yeah, I mean, um, it wouldn't wouldn't really hurt, I guess, um, to go through them. Or maybe the the like the lecture um, document, this PDF document, maybe. Yeah, I think maybe just like scroll through that and make sure that everything on the slides makes sense to you. Like, oh yeah, cool, seven four. I know what that is, like sort of thing. Like, I'm not going to go and ask you super super involved questions about like the implementations of the mutexes and stuff but like man if you can okay. explain to me really quickly i got priority inheritances when you see the slide like oh yeah cool i know that we're good um okay. i also released a lot of extra content this semester for instance um like i did extra like look at the youtube 
have to find. So for instance, like object oriented C, like I'm not gonna ask you questions about this. Um, okay. I mean, this is me sort of like, sort of help giving paradigms or whatever, but it's not part of the course's content. Um, pointers, I mean, while the lectures themselves aren't part of the course's content, if I ask you some sort of a question with a pointer, you should be able to answer it because you should have used pointers throughout the course. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, so like for instance, timers, we didn't, you might not have really made use of them in your, your project. Like you could have probably done the project without using timers, but you should probably still know what they are, mm -hmm. right? Because yep. we, they're part of free arts, they're part of real-time operating systems and they're a key part of like most operating systems. Mm -hmm. um, IPCs is also important to understand the fundamentals because you use them through using queues and semaphores. Um, scheduling. Yes, yeah, so I think the big ones is just mostly this RTOSs one, right? The yeah. Git stuff and the fetching and pulling. I mean, I don't think, for instance, I'm not going to really ask you to like on pull requests because you haven't done any, but I'm assuming that if I ask you questions about commits, you should all be fine with it because you've probably, mm -hmm. I hope you've all made dozens of commits throughout the semester, but you obviously mm -hmm. have none, done no pull requests. So it, I'm just asking you for things that you've probably used. So if you're a student watching this in the future who's, not use Git, assume that I'm going to ask you questions on the basic functionality of Git that you should have used. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's pretty, pretty easy. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Um, yeah, maybe a simple question about the exam. Um, so like, are the questions like specific for every student? Or... Yeah, so there was a bit, it's always a bit tricky with these oral exams to like plan them. Um, mm -hmm. So hold on, I might just stop recording this because this won't be necessarily relevant for students in the future. Um.